evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Dominique Bachelet. I'm an associate professor in biological and ecological engineering at Oregon State University, and I've been a climate change scientist since 1989. In the last decade or so, I focused my energy not only on creating content, but also designing a variety of communication tools to share climate change information. This year, it is my great pleasure to announce that the Corvallis Arts Center has generously chosen to host an art show this fall dedicated to climate change under the title, What Will Nature Do? The public media has been effective at uh, inflating the importance of climate deniers and at focusing on the worst negative aspect of the projected changes. Excuse me. The writing of these journalists has been found to cause denial, numbing, apathy, and more importantly, despair and hopelessness among the young. Today, we know that climate change is here and that we've seen the, young, the youth of the world rising and demanding action to limit the negative impacts on the generation. There are many ways to envision the future. And as a modeler, I've spent quite a bit of time simulating transitions towards a world adapted to warmer conditions. Given the inertia that has followed the thousands of publications, reports, and congressional hearings, I find it essential to diversify our approach to envision the future if we want to reach a broader audience. My optimistic view is that climate change was caused by us humans, thus we can do something about it. Many colleagues have talked about solutions and identified low-hanging fruits to get there. I'm hoping that through this series of lectures by scientists who are experts in their field, Artists are inspired to give us their vision of what might happen when we get people engaged in working together in the spirit of responsibility and solidarity to fix the most egregious problem we've created. Today it is my extreme pleasure to introduce our sixth speaker. I have asked the science speakers to um, inspire artists by showing us how ecosystems do function to survive adversities through adaptation and evolution. But today we have a scientist who is also an artist and who's famous among us climate change scientists because her work has been used in many of our presentation and we totally enjoyed it. So Jill, thank you so much for being here tonight and I really look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and talk with everyone. Um, so I'm going to give a presentation tonight about um, the artwork I do and a little bit, a little bit about the science that inspired that, and show some of the past pro projects I've done and what I'm working on right now, and kind of just talk about my my process for creating these and what I'm trying to achieve and in, in combining art and science. Um, so right now I'm I'm based uh, in in Portland, Maine, um, and uh, but I have spent quite a bit of time in the um, Pacific Northwest as well. Okay, share. Let me know if there's ever ever any issues with my presentation. So we're we'll talking about my science communication through art. So right now, what I tell people is that I'm working as a climate change artist and a science communicator. And the photo on the left is my current little art space. I don't have a big studio space yet. Um, so that's that's where I'm sitting right now and where I do all of my paintings is just this art, art setup where I live. And in the photo on the right, I'm creating a painting while I was out doing science field work in the North Cascade Range in Washington. I also have a background in earth and climate science. I did my degrees at the University of Maine. And so when I initially went there, I did my undergrad degrees in studio art and at the same time in earth and climate science and was trying to figure out ways to combine those. Um, and then after finishing those, I decided to stay on at the University of Maine and do a master's of science. And for that research, I got to work in Antarctica with the photo on the bottom left. And my master's project was basically kind of a piece in the puzzle of how the ice sheet is going to respond to warming. So the other photos here in the top left, um, I'm in New Zealand and I was taking a little sample or like piece of rock from the top of that boulder and um, an ice, or not an ice sheet, sorry, a glacier would have left that boulder there in the past during the last ice age. In the top right, I'm taking a measurement of soil um, in the Falkland Islands, um, which if any of you aren't familiar, are off the tip of South America. 
And then in the bottom right, I'm again in Washington where I work on the mountain glaciers. So I just wanted to talk a tiny bit about the research that I participate in in Washington because um, I think of all the research, it's the one that has really defined me the most and defined the artwork that I do the most. And so this is a photo from um, this past summer, August in August 2020. Um, we were a little uncertain um, as a project if we were going to go out this summer, but we thought it was really important that we still did um, because we have a continuous record of measurements across the same group of mountain glaciers in Washington um, since 1983. So the project that I work with is called the North Cascade Glacier Climate Project. And my dad started it um, when he was a PhD student in the 80s and every year has continued to go back to the same group of glaciers and you know measure how much snow do they get in the winter, how much melt happened in the summer, how much are they you know, retreating year to year. And so I absolutely love getting to go out with him every August and we work with other scientists and science communicators. And one, one thing that a lot of these things that you, you may be a little more familiar with than people here um, in the East Coast of the United States, but I like to kind of highlight to people um, some of the dramatic changes that I kind of have witnessed of climate change and working in Washington. And so here we're really not affected, um, at least at the moment, by kind of forest fire activity. So kind of having that be a part of um, our field seasons in Washington really since 2015 has been um, a really negative impact. Um, and then likewise, when you see these changes like um, in how the snow is looking, so like on the left where um, we can tell that snow is from this past winter because it's still you know very um, white and fresh looking and um, there hasn't been really time for like debris to collect on it over years. Whereas on the, the right hand photo, we're on a glacier that has a lot of this debris and rock fall on it because there's no longer any kind of snow left on that portion from the, pr the prior winter. And then this is a photo of me from this summer as well. And um, behind me is the very end of a, one of the big glaciers on, on Mount Baker in Washington. And um, most of the glacier is extending out of sight, but this is the, the very end of it, which is called the terminus. And I am standing where this glacier used to end when I first started working at this site in 2009. And so just 12 years of change um, and um, a few hundred feet that the glacier has retreated. And um, it's hard to think about not just that, that distance, but also the amount of volume that, of ice that has been lost just over, um, just over a decade. And, um, and it's interesting to also hear from my dad where he has seen the glacier retreat to since the 80s. Of course, it's a lot further. And so I think for me, um, getting to go back to these same places year after year and see the change, you know, is really impactful and it really creates, I obviously have like an emotion, like a relationship with these places. I care about them. You know, I feel a lot of emotions about what's happening. And I recognize that these glaciers are, you know, going to get a lot smaller um, and just hope that, you know, some of the more healthy ones, healthy, I guess I just mean, you know, get enough snow still, um, we'll be able to persist just in just be smaller. And I know they're such an important, important water resource for the region. So this is just the photo, another photo of Mount Baker, um, which is one of the mountains. So we work on a few glaciers um, around different sides of Mount Baker. And I just think it's so kind of spectacular, especially um, you know, we don't have views like this back here in Maine. And so getting to work in these places, it just makes me really appreciate them. And um, it's hard to see, it's hard to see them change right now. So I wanted to kind of transition and speak to what, um, how I'm kind of using these skill sets um, between art and science. So I think as a scientist, um, I have gained that or developed that kind of scientific practices skill set. So, you know, being able to go out in Washington and know you know, what questions to ask and um, being able to answer those questions about what's happening to the glaciers, for example. Um, I've also gained that background, initial background and just how our earth and climate system works. So I can understand climate change over earth history, um, you know, to a very simple extent and, um, and then understand like how humans are causing climate change today and why we can easily prove that. 
Um, and then lastly, um, as a scientist learning, what are the ways that, you know, scientists most often communicate? And I think that that tends to be through, you know, talks and posters at conferences, and then through kind of publications in science journals that are very like da uh, data heavy. And so a lot of that kind of that information is really important, um, but it's not always, you know, friendly for or easy to understand for um, a general audience who's not familiar. Even if you're, you know, a scientist in a completely different field, it can be hard to understand it. So as an artist, I have focused more on developing kind of a creative skill set and, and creating a narrative in my work. Um, I've gained a background in figuring out how to incorporate topics that are complex into one painting, and then learning about how art can um, really communicate, you know, it doesn't have to be visual, that's what I'm speaking to because of my art, but through like visuals, through the composition that you choose and through incorporating emotion into the story that you tell. So in combining them, I'm trying to pair that scientific information with the visuals I'm making that, you know, have, you know, have some kind of beauty to them and create that more maybe emotional view of the climate change data or the environmental story. And I hope that that makes those stories maybe for some people, you know, more relatable or more understandable than maybe the science alone. It's just a di different, different audiences. So my first kind of foray into combining science and art was always just painting when I got to go do science field work in all those places. And so this is also from Washington this summer and I was painting this big ice fall that's on a glacier on Mount Baker. Um, and so just being able to like take what I've learned in, in science or, or si art informs my science too, but just sitting and observing and um, thinking about like the landscape and what I'm seeing and appreciating it and taking that kind of like step back or moment to to do so and um, do, using art as like a, a means to do so. And so those art pieces has, have often just reflected literally the things that we're doing, the things that I'm seeing. Um, and then like these, these two pieces were done um, from photographs after returning from the field because it's harder for me to do um, kind of, you know, action or, or people, you know, images on the spot. And so um, these were my first kind of ways to share the work that I got to do with people. And I think that was especially interesting to me because, again, I was working in landscapes that were weren't familiar to um, kind of most of my kind of colleagues at, at the university. So I I'm now making work that incorporates scientific data directly into it. Um, and before kind of talking about this image and the data, I just wanted to quickly speak to how I came up with the idea of doing this. And, um, and that came from doing that field work in, in Washington every summer. And so um, in 2015, I was out there in August and working on the glaciers and it was just the most um, kind of dramatic I've ever seen in terms of loss um, loss of snow, um, a really bad winter um, in terms of the kind of amount of forest that year, which is such the entire field season was hazy. Um, and then it was just such a bad, just such a bad um, drought year. And so just seeing the streams and reservoirs looking really depleted and the, the plants and um, the plants always like kind of start their growing season later up in the mountains for based on when the snow banks melt and everything was just kind of passed and gone by the time we got there, which isn't usual. And so it was just really kind of an emotional experience for me. I was really um, upset by all those things. And when I came back to Maine, away from all of those, um, I really wanted to find a way to communicate that with my classmates um, in my art classes. And so um, I made the painting on the right about a mountain glacier, and I used the data that we have collected during the project. Um, and so that's the graph line on the left. The one I used is that darker blue graph line. And so on the, the y-axis there um, is annual mass balance, which is just the budget of the glacier each year. So how much snow it gains versus how much melt um, causes it to lose that snow and ice. And so when that budget is, is negative, the, the glacier is going to be getting smaller. 
And so on the x-axis is the time frame 1984 to 2014. And so three, or sorry, 30 years of um, change showing how that glacier is um, really retreating fast. And so I made that the profile of a retreating glacier in my painting and tried to really capture some of the, the beauty and kind of abstracted the glacier a little bit and did a lot of kind of patterns to really kind of highlight how kind of striking and um, amazing these land, landscapes are. And they have such kind of land, cool landforms within them and kind of made uh, the glacier appear more kind of debris covered and kind of grain brown at the bottom. And so from here, I've just continued to make a lot of different types of, of data art. So I'm gonna show you some more examples. This is a painting that I completed in 2018 and it's about the Gulf of Maine. So first I'll kind of go through those um, like points that I highlighted on the right and then I'll talk about the painting. So um, I just kind of wanted to highlight a little bit about my process. And so when I'm trying to decide a topic, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many things to choose from. And so it's something that, you know, I, I think when I have finished a project and I'm looking for another, um, and I'm just choosing a story about something that really strikes, strikes me or, you know, strikes someone else that I hear about and um, want to communicate, you know, that story and the emotions behind it. And so my second step after deciding like a general topic, like, okay, I want to do something about the Gulf of Maine, like what should my focus be? So then I'll look for data and um, that can definitely be a tough part of the process because sometimes the data can be hard to find. Sometimes the data I expect to exist might not, um, it just depends. And so um, one thing I also do is um, now is reach out to um, scientists within the, who are, who are specialists within the fields I'm interested in um, and get their thoughts on it and also make sure you know, if I'm using their data, for example, that the story I'm telling in my in my artwork is the right one. And then the last thing I do once I have that kind of topic and, and the data for it is create that story that becomes my painting. And um, I'll show some process photos for that in the next um, slide. And so this, this painting, as I said, is about um, the Gulf of Maine. And so the data line is the top surface there of the ocean. And um, that is showing temperature increase in the Gulf of Maine just over the last 15 years. Um, and I don't know if this is a headline any of you have seen, but there's a common headline that I see here in Maine that the Gulf, is, Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. I think that um, as Dominique spoke to a little bit at the beginning is a little bit alarmist. And I think that can be problematic and kind of telling people that like our oh, like the ocean here is always going to be the you know fastest warming one in the world because it's like well some years it might be warming faster a lot of the times but that's not always going to be the case and so I think the story that I've heard from researchers is more that like yes the the temperature is rising here but it's more that the the um, the changes in that temperature are really rapid so we have these very sharp increases and decreases in temperature and rather than kind of the slow cyclical changes that you used to have. And so I think that that could be a really difficult thing for species to adjust to. And so in the painting, I chose some different species that could help tell that story um, and also kind of connect with the story of fishing. And so I chose cod, which I have disappearing across the painting um, because they've been really overfished here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I chose shrimp and lobster and for Maine lobster, kind of like a really, a species that we really associate the state with are kind of an important um, thing for, um, I guess, like the tourist industry here. And I know they're really sensitive to water temperature. So that kind of is a murky future for them. And then in the sand, I have uh, soft shell clams, which are really sensitive um, to changes in ocean chemistry. And then the last element that I included is the fishing boat to introduce that story of um, human impact. And also just think about our role if, if the temperatures are warming and the chemistry is changing as a result, um, kind of what is our role in making sure we still have you know, sustainable fishing practices. And then these are just some process images. Um, so like the top two on the right are kind of where I start any pieces. Um, I'll do a few dozen really simple um, sketches. And I think for me, the most difficult part of any piece is 
figure out how it's going to look. And um, that just helps me a ton. It's like, you know, just to get those ideas out of your head and onto the paper. And once I kind of force that to happen, kind of like force that creativity and just make myself keep thinking and planning and then, you know, take some space from it and come back. Um, I just get so many different ideas that I kind of wouldn't have thought of on my first try. And so once I kind of come up with that, um, that final um, composition for my paint for my piece, I create the, the final detailed sketch, which is the in the, the bottom panel, those three is the left one. And um, I choose to paint right on top of that sketch because um, that's like a, an outline for me to keep to have all my details there and paint right on top of the data and the species and things. And um, then kind of like build up my layers from there with the watercolor. And I'll occasionally, and I, I'll use a little bit of colored pencil or acrylic paint sometimes if I need the paint to sit a little bit more on top of the watercolor, kind of go back over something. And um, this is a painting that I made, um, got to commission for the cover of um, Time Magazine this past summer in July, 2020. So um, of course, for me as an, an early career artist who's really just starting to gain some traction, it was such a huge opportunity that was just really, really crazy that happened. And um, I was just connected, got connected with the creative director of Time and D.W. Pine and he, um, he, he basically is the, the leader in, in choosing the covers each, um, each, um, for each issue. And so he had reached out to me um, about the July cover because every July they do an issue about climate change. And at the time he told me that, you know, if I was interested, they wanted me to try to, try to create a piece for it if I had the, had the time, because they only gave me two weeks. Um, and, you know, once it was made, it's still, you know, up to him and others if it's chosen, it, you know, it depends on how it turns out. But of course it was worth it to try. And so I could kind of just drop my other kind of responsibilities for those two weeks and focus on that. And so this painting on the left is that, um, the, the image that resulted, um, and I'll just play just like a little um, anima animation that they made to show like just first the data by itself and then how I chose to fill it in with images and then just the final look for that cover issue. Um, and I think just having, having an opportunity like that to me really spoke to how science, my science art or, and science art in general and different forms of science communication was really connecting with people. Uh, they wanted it kind of at this, you know, big of a scale and this is what they chose for the, for the image and, you know, thought it would, I'm assuming they choose covers based on what they think, you know, will resonate with people and, you know, convey something um, in a new way, in a strong way. And so I think that spoke to a lot of where we're at with science communication and what people are looking for. Um, and so the, the data um, in this painting, I really want it to be kind of global, not, you know, based in the United States. And so I'll just tell you what those like five data lines are in the painting with the different colors. And so the bottom there, the dark blue um, is increasing, um, or sorry, sea level rise uh, from 1880 to present. And then above that, the light blue is, um, a, is supposed to be glacial ice. And so that was total land ice loss. Um, I believe it's from um, 1960 to present. And by land ice, I mean both um, the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, and then all the ice on, on mountain glaciers. Above that with the trees is um, increasing renewable energy consumption worldwide from um, 1960 to present. Um, I wanted to have that message of um, action and hope in there as well. And then above that, the yellow area is increasing global temperature from 1880 to present. And then lastly, above that is um, the is CO2 consumption from 1880 to present. And um, time expressed a lot of interest in me, including that CO2 consumption line, because they really wanted to highlight how at the top of it there, there's that slight decrease. Um, and I haven't actually looked at what the total CO2 consumption was for 2020, but in July, it was predicted that there would be this, um, this decrease 
um, because of restricted or reduced um, travel due to COVID. And they wanted to kind of highlight that decrease. And um, I think they're, um, I think that was a, a good idea because even though CO2 consumption is going to go back up again this year, I expect it really, I think, highlighted that, you know, if globally we were to choose to act, we could really make a big difference pretty quickly in what we put out into the world. And so these are just um, on the, the two or some process shots. So on the left was I, when I was making all those simple sketches and then I had just highlighted um, my, my ideas for data. So um, I ended up choosing one of, the, or, or changing one of those. Um, and then in the middle was like a mock-up I had done because I was putting my little very simple um, paintings and sketches kind of in the cover and thinking about like how, how they fit. And then I, I sent the, sent this in a different format and pitched a few different ideas to the creative director. And he got back to me on which one um, to go forward with um, to create that final piece. Um, so then um, lastly, I wanted to show you um, what I'm working on right now. And so I have been pursuing um, collaborations more directly with scientists. And by that, I mean just um, working with them on a project specifically. And so the first, this is the first time I've gotten to do this and I'm about to, about to finish after a couple of years, but I'm working with a research team um, that is, that is um, based in Europe and they study paleoecology. So basically just like plant species in the past and how, how plants adapt to climate change. And so I am creating a series of five paintings for this research team and getting paid by the grant money from their research to do so. And we'll be using it in a lot of other ways, like on some of their papers at, at conferences, showing it in their university and things like that. So it's a really cool way to collaborate. And I'm looking towards doing more of that direct um, collaboration um, because I enjoy it. And it's also a good way to get kind of consistent funding for my artwork. And so I'll kind of walk you through what this series is about. Um, the, the painting on the left shows two um, women scientists and they're taking a core. So they're supposed to be standing on um, a frozen lake in Norway. And you can see through um, the lake water underneath the ice and down. Um, so it's like the whole body of the core extending down and then hitting the bottom of the lake and the layers of sediment at the bottom. And it's those layers of sediment that they are taking a core of. And then on the, the right is the next painting in the series, which is again, taking a core, but now um, it's in a warmer month. And so they're, they're standing right on top of a bog and taking a core down into um, the soil. And so the, the uh, sorry, the, the, I guess the top layers are more, are like more brown, like more organic material. And then as it gets lower down, you have more gray, um, gray material that is less organic. It's more kind of like um, clay and things that glaciers produce. And so that's showing a transition from kind of our present day climate to um, the last ice age when glaciers would have covered this region. And that wouldn't be that um, shallow in the soil, but this was a way for me to kind of show it in, in this scale for the painting and show those layers all together. So the um, third painting in the series on the left um, was then taking that, that core from that soil that changed to from brown to gray and showing the different um, things that the scientists are finding in those layers. And so all those little objects are supposed to be pollen and um, seeds and things that they find in the layers. And all of those are going way back in time. So they're ancient and are you know, can be up to like 10,000 years old. And so they can take these ancient pollen greens and ancient seeds from plant species that used to be alive and, you know, figure out when they were alive and figure out um, like where, where they lived at the time, like what kind of climates were they living in. And so then the, the fourth painting on the right is um, showing a map view. And um, basically there are these little like funny shapes on the map, like speckled all over it. And those are supposed to be pollen grains of the Norway spruce. And 
those are the little Norway spruce um, are marking data points where they took cores, sediment cores, and found um, Norway spruce pollen and then dated that pollen and figured out when the Norway spruce lived here. Um, so basically the yellow part is present. And then as you get into green, it's going back in time. Um, the dark green is like 5,000 years ago. And then the very darkest blue kind of in the bottom right of the map is 10,000 years ago. So basically the story here is that the, um, if you look down at like the dark blue blobs, like 10,000 years ago, that's where the Norway spruce were living. And then they traveled up to the north as the climate warmed and hooked all the way around um, Scandinavia back down to where the yellow is. And so then in the front of the painting, I have some examples of the, I have the Norway spruce kind of as um, the foreground to fill that negative space. And, oh, these were some uh, process kind of sketches. What I would, I tried to send them something a little more detailed. Some of these ended up changing as we went back and forth a lot, but I would send them these kind of, these kind of simple, um, or not that simple, but these kind of um, sketches of what I was working on. And then there's going to be one more painting in the series. And um, I'm kind of thinking about, I'm using that figure that's on the left, which um, the, the collaborator sent me, the, the um, woman researcher I'm working with. And she, so this, this last painting is going to be about how um, tree lines change over time with climate, how um, different species, like I'm focusing on trees, but have to adapt to climate. So sometimes they can grow higher up the mountain, excuse me, when it's warmer, sometimes they are lower down the mountain. And so that final painting on, um, this is a very simple sketch of what it might be like on the right. And that red, I just highlighted because I'm thinking about having um, a temperature line and um, below that temperature line is going to be kind of like the forest as it exists now. And above that temperature line is going to be um, trees that are kind of having to creep up higher in elevation as the climate warms and um, basically to communicate why this, re why this research about the past really matters um, for the present. So I'm hoping to finish um, this painting um, in the next uh, month or two. And then I just wanted to show a couple of examples because I'll make when I'm creating a piece, um, I'll make these like collages on my computer. I'll, I'll just make them in a, in a presentation and just have um, in like PowerPoint or Keynote or what, whatever you use, I'll have, um, I'll have them as like my kind of um, resource images for making the painting. So like I had all these images that the researchers had sent me of what field work looked like, what the trees looked like in the landscape. Um, and then, um, figuring out like how the people are going to look, how this all, how is this all going to go? Like the figure in red is actually my brother who's a scientist. And then um, I was trying to figure out like, okay, how's like, how is that like face going to look? So I had that like woman's face I had found. Um, and then like um, that person in the gray shirt is me. Like I was trying to pose for it. So it's just like all the funny stuff you do as an artist to try to like figure out how something should look in your painting. <laughs> And then, and then last, just like this was a lot of the, these were the images the researcher sent me on the left of what the kind of pollen and um, seeds look like under the microscope, which were really cool. So it was fun painting those. Um, and the colors I think are because of the microscope, I think they are just like browns and thing, things. Um, and then I included that little like image on the right because a lot of times like the information, I, I feel like it has to be like really back and forth with the relationship when I'm working with a scientist, you know, about a topic I don't really know about, like, so this was like a kind of sketch she had done for me, and it's just kind of funny to see, and like, I had, a, I had to ask a lot of questions about it, um, and it's just been a lot of back and forth and trying to figure out, you know, how to tell their story, and so that's what she's there to help me do. Um, so I just have a couple more slides. Um, I wanted to kind of start to sum it up by kind of speaking to why it's so good to communicate in different ways. And um, in the top left is just a screenshot from that, the project I'm a part of in Washington that my dad started. And so on that, on that website, you know, you can see, you can access uh, the publications um, that, the, that the, um, the study has put out over the years. You can read more like kind of um, broader audience information about the glaciers and how they're doing. And there's the photo glossary and information about wildlife and glacier runoff and lots of topics on that site that you can access so you can understand it if you're interested. 
um, to the right of that, I have a photo from our field work. Um, we always take a lot of photos of what we do to, to share with people what it, what it looks like, why these places you know, matter, how we do our work you know, in all weather conditions. Um, in the top right, I have one of those uh, field sketches that I make, which are watercolors just of what I'm seeing and experiencing what it looks like to be out there. And then on the bottom left, I have a screenshot of one of the publications from the project. And so, you know, those are going to be very, um, they're going to be written in, you know, a very concise kind of scientific way with a lot of like kind of specific jargon and, um, you know, going to have a lot of numbers and a lot of figures in them data. And so that's really important, um, but not again, like always understandable for everyone. Um, so then to the right of that, I again had that, um, that graph that I used that the project has put out. And, and now um, we obviously have the data updated, but I made, I made the pinning on the right in 2015, um, but now we have you know, almost 40 years of, um, or I guess more like, yeah, cl getting close to 40 years of, of data for the North Cascades glaciers. And so then that painting on the right has been my way to capture the emotion that I feel when I think about that, that change to the glaciers. So one thing that I've been really taking off with over, um, I guess the last year and a half, because I started before COVID, um, is doing a lot of outreach with students, um, like mainly K through 12, but um, bringing data art to them so that they can do activities that are, you know, using math and science, but also um, using art and that way if there's you know something one student is interested in more than um, one topic they're interested in too that is a good fit and so for me it's been really inspiring just to see what um, younger generations are making work about and the things that they care about um, sometimes I'll bring graphs to them about topics in their area sometimes you know if, if the teachers want to do a bigger project then um, the, they'll lead the students in finding their own data and so there's been a lot of different ways that it's been done. Um, but I'm always so inspired to see um, kind of how much they care and understand about what's happening. And so here's some more um, paintings by a middle school class. And I've, there's been so many times I've just been really blown away by what they create and the stories that they choose to tell in their work. Um, I think the one thing I wish I would see is, um, you know, a little bit more of those positive stories, but I also understand myself. I've only kind of just started to touch on more positive stories of data in my art. It's something I want to do a lot more of, but it, it can make me a little sad when that's, when that's kind of what I only see for um, the students. And then lastly, um, I think another great resource is um, sharing work in, in forums like, like, I mean, not, you know, getting to time was amazing, but just on um, kind of some like journals and um, books. I did a collaboration with the American Alpine Club, which is the t-shirt. And then I did a collaboration with a small um, ski company here in Maine, whose um, business is all about like using um, all materials found here in Maine, the wood for the skis and everything. And so I had data about Maine on the skis as like a good kind of conversation piece when you're on the lift. And so I think again, like I mentioned for time, um, getting to do this just speaks to that kind of need for ways to share climate change information um, in ways that um, really speak to people in ways that incorporate emotion. And so the kind of interest that I've gotten has expressed to me that, that desire in people for it. So, I, I really think that different um, different types of media, like I've been talking about, can communicate complexity so differently. And so uh, I think that uh, someone who's done, you know, a bit of science and is now diverging into um, mainly art and science communication, um, it's been a good perspective. And, you know, what are the like kind of loose boundaries of what these different medias are for and like what kind of audiences can they reach? And so well, that's through the art like I'm doing or, you know, journalism through the science data itself through doing school outreach, like what are um, the different ways that we can connect with people about a topic. And I view art as one really powerful way to do so. Um, and I think just one of those reasons is because it can tell those stories in just such emotional ways, as I keep saying, and um, I really, I really hope to continue to make this data art about climate change because I, I want to keep making it feel real for people. But um, 
again, I don't, I don't want to do it in that alarmist way. I kind of want to show like, this is, you know, literally what's happening. It's important to recognize the data um, and recognize that, you know, our world is going to be going to be changing a lot. But um, I think I, I also do want to consider my voice and encouraging people to take action. Um, and I think education is a good step in that, but I also want to show those positive stories because I, you know, truly I um, agree with Dominique said, I have a lot of hope for um, our ability to, to do stuff about this basically. Um, well, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to um, talk with any of you now or answer any of your questions. So I'm going to read a few of the questions that have come up. Um, Bruce, who's a Forest Service a wildlife biologist, is asking you how was uh, how has your art informed your science? Yeah, I like that question. That's only something I've thought about. I feel like um, I feel like science, you know, really can take a lot of creativity. Um, you're you really, you know, of course, like figuring out like new things or, you know, even figuring out what questions to ask. So I think, I think that kind of problem solving skill set, um, I did a lot in like the art room, like just figuring out like, what am I going to make, you know, a painting, what am I going to make about for this assignment, you know, in my art class, you know, as in school, and bringing that to science field work and figuring out how we're going to kind of tackle something that for that day, for example, I think the other, the other thing is um, just that kind of power again of, of observation and um, learning to notice kind of detail in a landscape is something that has translated really well from art to my science. Yeah, on one of, of your slides you had the notes in you know pencil from the the scientist who was explaining to you the different pollen. I like the way she called the Mickey Mouse pollen. <laughs> Mickey yeah, Mouse pollen. yeah, yeah. It does look <laughs> like that. Yeah, it, it does. Weird. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, and um, let's see. Um, Cynthia is asking, is your work primarily done on a consultation contracted basis or based on your own scientific interests? Yeah, I guess it, it's been, so far it's been mainly my own scientific interests because only, only that recent project was I like kind of more commissioned to do that. Like most of them have just been, yeah, have been for my, for my own interest, I think. I'll, I'll keep doing a bit of both because I, I really want to work with research teams, as I said, but um, I, I also want to make, you know, work about the topics that I care most about. And I, I also think sometimes the research, like the Scandinavia project I shared, I think it's really cool research, um, but it is like, it is still like kind of, um, I guess like a dense kind of topic. And so I think making, making sure I make work that is still like really um, relatable to people and understandable and more speaking to kind of things that, that they're gonna be like witnessing is really important. And Jerry, who's a professor on campus here, but also an artist, a glass artist is asking, oh. do you think your audience is interpreting the data you are representing or is the visual representation more of a hook to get people interested in hearing, reading about the data? Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I do hear feedback sometimes, but you know, a lot of times I don't. And so, yeah, I think um, I always hope that it's like that hook for them learning more. You know, I assume that that only happens now and then, but even if it's just that little bit of information that they can get, or like when I show my work, I'll have, you know, a little, um, a little paragraph like underneath it at a gallery or, or wherever I show it. And um, just to describe like if they do want to learn more about it what what that is and um, like on my website I have the links to all of the data that I use or like information about it so it's really accessible um, so I, yeah I, I hope that that's the case um, that it's like kind of just that first step of like awareness at least Jerry you want to add something no, I, I'm asking because I struggle with that. I try and incorporate art in my art and science. Um, and I'm playing now with different levels of abstraction of the scientific imagery. You know, do I want to do something that's really 
very literal or do I want to further abstract it so it's not really understandable, but maybe more visually appealing. But then you would have to rely on people being curious about enough about that to right. then follow up on it to have it mean something. Yeah, I feel I like yeah, I feel like I think about that a lot too. Um, is like how I feel like I've done a lot, like someone asked me recently kind of what I think about like infographics inspiring my work and I hadn't really thought about that, but I guess there's a little bit of that into what I do and um, I feel, yeah, it's a good, it's a hard thing to think about, but I, I like like to, I like to try to like incorporate that style or like that, those abstractions, like those patterns into my work and I think that it's worth like playing with at least and I think some of not really what I showed tonight maybe but I think some of my pieces are more abstract and I feel like there's a few that are that are my most popular like when I sell like um you know like digital prints of them and things and so I think that's been cool to think about but I, I think that people um viewing other environmental artists work who have really different styles I feel like people do really like stuff too that is and um, necessarily like that immediately like clear um, story they have to dig in. Okay, thanks. Along those lines, uh, um, well, first of all, Cynthia says your work is much more rich than an infographic. <laughs> and um, John Friedlander is saying he wonders if you're familiar with the data visualization work by Edward Tufte. And I bet you are. Tufte? Um, it sounds familiar, but okay. I can't. I can't think of what his work is like off the top of my head. I'm like completely on to that link. Uh, yeah. Um, He's done a lot of statistics. Oh, visualization okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, Jenny was asking. Uh, you mentioned. Well, I want to use more positive stories. What positive stories and perspective do you have in mind that you would like to portray? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure yet. I think there, I, I do think there are a lot of them. Um, I think most of them are going to be human based because it's kind of hard to, you know, the, the world just is, is changing. So it's kind of hard to see them sometimes from an environmental perspective, but I think from a human perspective, I can definitely see um, the, the positive changes that we can make. And I think the couple that I've done so far have been kind of just renewable energy, but there's a lot more, you know, types of positive stories than just that. And so I think just the creative, I don't have a good example on top of my head, but like the good creative problem solving things that people are doing right now, or just seeing what like city plans, like cities or towns are implementing. So like they wanna, you know, have this like, you know, eco-friendly um, housing and these like, you know, bus systems, they're all electric and all these plans for, you know, goals by, you know, 2030 or, or whatever their, their timeline is. And it's really cool to see all of those, um, those changes like being talked about and plans being made. So maybe something that touches on, you know, the work that a lot of people really are doing. Um, maybe something like that. Next Monday, uh, Erica Fleischmann was, will be talking about, you know, wildlife species that actually are adapting to, to the changes. And so it'll be interesting to hear the, 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 the positive stories about adaptation um, that we are seeing. I always say, you know, about, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, all the science um, articles in science magazine were all, everything is gonna go extinct. And now more and more we see at the end of the article, but we're seeing adaptation and this species is really not gonna go extinct. And so there's a lot of hope there. And when we start measuring what's happening in nature. Um, let's see, yeah. Yeah, Hester said, the lack of traffic creating cleaner air in the last 12 yeah. months, so quick we could see an effect. Yes, I was just yeah. looking at those statistics and actually, yeah, we can see an effect It changed by about 20%, but it's coming back up. And it's mostly because of not, I mean, it's us of course driving, but it's also transferring um, all sorts of merchandise from one country to another. So oh, I'm sure okay. Brexit has something to do with the decrease also, but that's oh. another story. Um, do you have, uh, from Jenny again, do you have non-science art activities you enjoy as a change of pace oh. and to refresh <laughs> yourself? Uh, I like that. I, I, I should have more for sure because um, I as I love painting so much and that's my favorite part of, of it all. It's like, you know, there's so much planning and sketching and then you finally get to paint. But 
I definitely need need to do more of that. And um, like one thing I will do sometimes is go outside and, and paint and just like being able to be out during it is amazing. Or another thing I do sometimes is, um, yeah, just like set myself kind of a, a little painting project that's just for fun, but I do it too infrequently, I would say. I should make that a practice. Um, so what was the most surprising thing you've ever found? Most surprising thing I've ever found? <laughs> Uh huh. Oh, um, I guess like I immediately jump to like just any like stuff to do with environmental change, but I guess it could be anything. Um, like in working in Washington, um, we one year, um, there's one, um, one spot that's like really popular, like hike, um, to a lake, but we go beyond it to like the glacier. Um, it's called like Blanca Lake, and there's Columbia Glacier behind it. And at the base of um, Columbia Glacier that year was a new um, pond that had just formed from the last year. That was also in 2015, which again, like I said, it was a really bad year out there. And so it was just crazy because like a big piece of the glacier kind of collapsed and and um, and formed this like big, and there was this big pond kind of out in front of it. And so then now every year we just kind of see that grow because it's kind of like a little like kind of valley there. And so that was, I guess I I realized kind of as a scientist that was going to happen at some point, but you just I hadn't really considered like it would, and then we just kind of came over the rise that year and saw it. Um, it's really surprising. Have you ever been frustrated in your line of work by something or another? People you work for or, or <laughs> things you you were not you couldn't get the right you know, drawing or, or painting about? <laughs> Definitely, yeah, of course. Um, I guess I can speak to like this project that I've been working on with the research in Scandinavia because because it's my first time doing something like this. I feel like I have now learned a lot about that kind of collaboration and what I need to ask from them um, because, you know, they're experts on this topic and um, and I'm not. And so it's just been I really needed to help them teach me like that's why I'm collaborating is so they can really, you know, share their research with me in a way I can understand and communicate. Um, and I need to, you know, un be able to understand in order to do so. And so there was some some like frustrations kind of at the beginning of the project. Um, because I was just having a hard time kind of figuring out like what to make work about and and there was a little bit of that barrier and um, like a big time zone difference and they all they all speak English I don't I don't speak any other languages unfortunately but um, but there was still a little bit of like a language barrier and um, kind of some of the terms we were using and so um, yeah I sometimes got a little bit frustrated but have learned a lot about kind of how to just um, more directly ask what I need from them in the future. Mm -hmm. So I've used your graphics about fire but um, are you planning to do more uh, with the, especially with after 2020, there's new data on fire. Are you planning to do more graphics with that? Good question. Um, I hadn't been planning to, I feel like that would be good to do another piece. I haven't actually done a piece that has um, a data line about forest fire activity. I've done, I have a piece with a fire in it, but it's about right. temperature. Um, and I think that would be cool to do um, especially, I mean, you know, cool and not cool because it, it's interesting for me to look at dramatic data, but it's not interesting that's happening. Um, and like just how I'm sure that like the data behind it is showing, you know, such a crazy, um, you know, increase in a lot of places. So, yeah, but you can also think about all the animals that come after the fire. So you could look at population of, you know, like black back with peckers and, and, you know, and all those, um, fire yeah. dependent and and the uh the the, the big trees the giant sequoias that actually need fire in order right. to produce so that'd be kind of cool to yeah i like the idea of when when you when you talk about these stories making sure you're including those different sides to them yeah yeah so um for the the artists who are listening to your talk tonight um what are your the one thing you would like them to take away from your talk and advice on how to deal with painting something for this particular call? Oh, yeah. Um, I think for me, it kind of comes down to those steps that I take and um, 
uh, as I spoke to, not necessarily with commissions, but you know, when I'm making I'm making something about a topic, like especially when I'm not sure what to make, it's really come to like choosing something that I just really, you know, care very deeply about and um, maybe have been impacted by it, but if not, it's just something that I'm very like tuned into. And so I think really tapping in for me, tapping into that emotion. Um, and then once I do so, um, I think it, you know, this could depend based on like what type of an artist you are and how you create, but I really do try to really push that planning stage where I'm brainstorming and I'm writing things down and sketching. And I think really just pushing myself and what are like, you know, 10 different ways I could tell the story and like, okay, what are my top three? And just keeping to keeping pushing that um, to tell the narrative. Um, and I guess like the last the last thing I would say is like um, if if you are stuck also, I feel like not feeling like you're alone in that and kind of trying to make work about what about that topic. And so I think like two things I've been trying to do is like one, um, connect, just like kind of ask for thoughts and advice, like, and I've been trying to reach out to other artists who make environmental work when that's the case, um, or sometimes just, you know, to, to fellow artists. And then like two, um, perhaps even like contact, finding someone like um, looking someone up online and finding someone to contact who, you know, maybe does work about that topic and um, just having like, you know, setting up a Zoom call with them or something and showing them what you're working on and seeing what they think um, might be another good thing. So not kind of, you know, making this sometimes um, something that you don't have to work alone on. And my last question before we stop this is, uh, um, are you going to make an art piece for this show? <laughs> are you going to respond to our call? Oh, I would, I would love to do so. <laughs> Cynthia was asking the question is like, that would be wonderful if you were to submit something. That'd be great. I would really, really love that. Thank you. Oh, sure. And I want to thank you again for being here tonight. It was absolutely lovely. And uh, thank you. And thank you for everybody who was here listening to, to Jill. And thank you for your questions. And on Monday, we have Erica Fleischman, who's the head of the climate change, um, sorry, let's see, the Climate Research Center, the Climate Change Research Center here on campus. And she'll talk to us about different species and how they adapt to change. Um, her talk is at noon on, on Monday. So don't forget, it's noon, not five o'clock. And uh, thanks again. And uh, see you Monday. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for listening and your all your great questions. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Good night.